Hey, welcome Mission City Bible Church. Uh, so glad to be worshiping our Lord together this morning. And so I wanna highlight a couple things for you, some announcements. Uh, make sure to go on our website, missioncitybiblechurch.ca and click on the stream page. Or you can use the Church Center app and do the same. And you can do a couple things there. Uh, use the connections card that we have there. And the connections card, especially if you're visiting, it's a great way for you to let us know uh, that you're visiting, that you're with us. Also, if you have questions there or concerns, if you uh, have interests, you want to know more about youth or uh, baptism or whatever it would be, that's a great place to ask those questions. Also, uh, you can give there online. I just want to encourage you, especially in these times, if you continue to give, uh, to the ministry for the glory of the Lord. Uh, make sure there as well that you fill out prayer requests, especially in the times that we're in. Again, I'll say it, I'll keep saying it, it's so important that you reach out in this way that we know how to pray for you. It's hard to connect, we don't know um, how, how a lot of you are doing. And so if you can send in prayer requests, that'd be fantastic. And then also to uh, answers to prayer, how God is answering those prayers. That'd be so encouraging. Uh, sign up for the e-news as well. Uh, the e-news is a great way, again, to stay up to date, to know what's going on, to get uh, different reports, elders reports, updates. So please do that. And so those are the, the highlights. Those are some of the announcements this morning. And so let's worship our, our Lord together. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope with no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested and my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new now. Life begins with you. Released from my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom he faithfully bore He canceled my debt and he called me his friend That's when death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace so Washes over me You have made me new Now life begins with you It's your endless love Pouring down on us You have made us new Our Savior displayed on a criminal's cross Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand That's when death was arrested and my life began 
That's when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new now. Life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new, now life begins with you. Oh, we're free, free, forever we're free. Come join the song of all the redeemed. Yes, we're free. Forever, amen When death was arrested And my life began Oh, we're free, free Forever, we're free Come join the song of all the redeemed Yes, we're free, free Forever, amen When death was arrested And my life began When death was arrested and my life began That's when death was arrested And my life began Are you hurting? sin Jesus is calling Have you come to the end of yourself Do you thirst for a drink from the well Jesus is calling Oh come to the altar the Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with The precious blood of Jesus Christ Leave behind your regrets and mistakes Come today there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy From the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling Oh, come to the altar The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with The precious blood of Jesus Christ Oh, come to the altar the Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with The precious blood of Jesus Christ Oh Savior, isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Bow down before him, for he is Lord. Sing hallelujah, 
Christ is risen by what a Savior is and he wonderful sing hallelujah Christ is risen bow down before him for he is Lord of all sing hallelujah Christ is risen oh come to the altar the father's arms are open wide forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of jesus christ oh come to the altar the father's arms are open wide forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. We glorify your name. Bear your cross as you wait for the crown Tell the world of the treasure you found Father God Almighty, I am so grateful for this morning and the fact that we have some time together to focus our hearts and our minds on you alone. Lord God Almighty, we worship you with everything that is within us today. We love you, Lord, with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I pray that in these moments that we have together this morning, that we would fix our gaze upon you, that we would turn aside from all the distractions of the world in which we live, and that we would live for you and you alone. I pray, Lord, that we would be reminded today of who you are, of your amazing love and who you have called us to be, the people of God, for such a time as this. And I pray, Lord, that the second part of that great command will be true in our lives as well, that we would love our neighbors, Lord, that we would love others, that we would show the love of Jesus Christ in very practical and meaningful ways to those around us, but that we would also love our neighbors by telling them the truth about Jesus Christ so, Father, I pray right now that we would take a moment and lift up those around us, Lord, that you have put in our paths by name, that we can have opportunity even today and tomorrow and this coming week to share the good news of Jesus Christ with. Church, take a moment and lift up some of those names. So, Father, as we cry out to you on behalf of these dear people, these dear loved ones, that by names that we have called out to you with right now, we pray, we ask, God, that you would do such amazing work this week in the hearts and lives of us and through us into the hearts and lives of many people, that we would uh, know firsthand the power of God at work through the church into the lives of the people that live in this world, Lord. Let light shine into darkness. Let truth ring true through all of our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. From heaven's throne you came to us and set your heart upon the cross we'll never know the sacrifice you've made 
For all our sin and all our shame You took the nails and took our place No one else could do what you have done One name is higher One name is stronger Than any grave, than any throne Christ exalted over all From the grave where death would die You rose again and brought us life You're reigning now, the Savior of the world You're reigning now, the Savior of the world one name is higher, one name is stronger than any grave, than any throne. Christ exalted over all, the only Savior, Jesus Messiah. To you alone, our praise belongs. Christ exalted over all. We'll sing your praise, we'll sing your praise, we'll sing your praise forever. We we'll lift your name, we we'll lift your name, Jesus over all. We'll sing your praise, we'll sing your praise, we'll sing your praise forever. We lift your name, we lift your name, Jesus over all. One name is higher, one name is stronger than any grave, than any throne. Christ exalted over all, the only Savior. Jesus Messiah, to you alone our praise belongs, Christ exalted over all. To you alone our praise belongs, Christ exalted over all. So I want to start today where we're going to end. I want you to open your Bibles, of course, to Acts chapter 2, and I want you to look at verse 41, and just in case you're finding your way there, I want to put that verse up on the screen for us as well right now. Um, verse 41 says this, so those who received this word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. All right, so a little context the church gathered to this point was 120 people. Now it's approximately 3,120 after today's passage. If my math is right, that's an increase of 2,600%, okay? Uh, this is indeed the first ever true revival. In verse 41, it also says these people were baptized. I got a few questions about that. How long did that take? Uh, where did they do it? Can you imagine the crowd? How did this take place? 3,000 people lining up to be baptized. That is just awesome. That is awesome. Again, always live in the text. I mean, this happened, right? It was that day. So over the course of this church, we've baptized well over 1,000 people. We are, that's phenomenal. We are so thankful for that. This church did it 3,000 in one day, all right? In one day. That's amazing. When God works, God works. So I want to also, just again, as you live in the text, imagine you're one of the 12 disciples and you're witnessing what you're witnessing. Just, okay, how much joy would you have in this moment as Peter's sermons kind of comes to a conclusion? Just a few weeks ago, you were terrified. I mean, you were scattering and you were deserting Jesus Christ who you claimed to follow again with total resolve. And now here you are, basically, you know, 50-something days later, and you're overcome, I mean, overwhelmed by the glory of the Lord and his transforming power that changed lives right before you. Wow, the grace of God. 
Can you imagine the God-glorifying chaos that would be taking place again on this day of Pentecost? Like just again, imagine the hugs, imagine the tears, imagine the rejoicing, imagine the prayers being offered. All these people are coming alive in Jesus Christ at the same time. Oh, and by the way, for those of us who may not like large churches, which would make it stranger if you're here right now, but for those people who don't like large churches, you'd be pretty grumpy at this point, right? You like your little tight little group of 100 so people, and all of a sudden, one day, 2,600% increase. They're like, no, right? right? So, I mean, something we've got to get over some of the things that we think we like, right? And how about we just be overjoyed with God is... I mean, if I ever find someone who complains to God that he's changing lives, I'd be like, come here. You know what I mean? Like, come on now. Come on now. Like, let's not be that person. It's amazing to me sometimes how far our self-centered ideas and desires will go, even in the face of God's glory. Tangent, let's get back on where we're trying to go now, right? You can't be grumpy when the Lord is so powerfully at work. There's no way. I mean, just imagine this moment and the Spirit of God, the absolute, supernatural, Christ-centered joy. Like just imagine how much joy would have been felt and known during this time. But here's the question today. I want to say that because I'd love to kind of build for us a little bit of a sense of what's happening in the text. But this leads into our thesis. How is it possible that 3,000 souls were saved in this day? How is that possible? I mean, surely as people watch the 3,000 lined up to be baptized, you're one of walking by, you'd be like, what in the world is going on here? I don't remember baptism being part of the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost in this time, because it wasn't. Gentiles really only ones who were baptized kind of into Judaism. And here you have this incredible scene. So people are like, what is happening here? Why is this happening? How is this happening? And that's what our text specifically answers today. How is it possible that 3,000 souls were saved? And two more words I want to put to that is this. Go Lord. Go Lord today. So Peter's preaching is going to explain everything we need to know to answer that question. So again, as we turn to Acts 2 and we start in verse 22, just a reminder, thousands and thousands and thousands are gathered, right, as Peter is preaching. A Holy Spirit bomb just went off, okay? Best Holy Spirit bomb ever. And then Peter says this in verse 22, picking up where we left off last week. Men of Israel, Hear these words, Peter, man, he's emboldened. He is filled by the power of God. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus, that phrase is used three times in this sermon, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men, meaning the Romans, God raised him up, loosing the pains of death. Why? This is so good. I mean, this better be underlined in your Bible. I mean, this whole passage is amazing. Because it was not possible for him to be held by it. How is it possible that 3,000 souls were saved? Answer number one is this. Because Jesus is alive. Because Jesus is alive. That's a reason for you, isn't it? That's a really good reason. Now, whenever I share my faith with someone... I often find myself saying early on, listen, listen, you know what? I just need to tell you, man, Jesus is real. Jesus is alive, and he absolutely changed my life. I love, I love, I love just, forcing, just looking people in the eyes and forcing them to these acknowledge, man, like, this is not just some made-up thing that's kind of arbitrary somewhere over there. This, no, no, he's real. Like, he's, he's real to me. He's real. He is alive. He has absolutely changed my life. That's why I love the song, I Know My Redeemer Lives, and uh, the version of Nicole C. Mullen, and she's singing, I Know My Redeemer Lives, and she says, I spoke to him this morning. Amen, that's so good. That's right. Did you speak to him this morning? I did. I know that my Redeemer lives, exactly. So verses 22 to 24, um, they're just awesome. This was our Easter text, actually, a few years ago at our church, and it still impacts me today as I read it. I just, I can't get out of my mind the beauty and the hub of this Jesus in the center of the text. It's so fitting because so true. Again, Peter uses this phrase, this Jesus, uh, three times. Once here in verse 23, um, also in verse 32. And then a final time, he uses that phrase, this Jesus, in verse 36. Um, that's so 
fitting because Jesus Christ is absolutely everything. I don't know who's here today, but I'm just telling you, like, history is his story. It is, it is everything revolves around Jesus Christ the Lord. This Jesus, and I want us to see this Jesus again as the hub and notice the four words that surround his life and work. Look on the screen for me, and we've used this in the past. I just wanted to bring it back because it's so helpful. So the center of this Jesus, I know what Peter says now as he's preaching to all the thousands that are listening. Uh, number one, he says, Jesus was attested to you, meaning Jesus was endorsed to you by God himself. The text says there, attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs. Notice that God did through him in your midst, which you have seen. I mean, this is where you stop and you just let God's word tell the story of history from the historical facts that we even know are so true? Has there anyone ever that's ever lived more powerful, influential than Jesus Christ of Nazareth? I mean, it's just, it's just, it's not even close. Look at us all here today. Look at us all here today. We're all gathered around the person of Jesus Christ. Can I marvel at that? I love, again, 2019, the year of our Lord. I love we're in Canada. I love that we're a continent away. I love 2,000 plus years, and we're still centering and worshiping our faces off to Jesus. How is that possible? Because he was attested to you by God with signs and wonders by God himself. Again, only Jesus calmed the storm, walked on water, fed the 5,000. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Who else can do such things? I mean, even Jesus' baptism himself, the, 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 the Father's voice rings out and says, this is my beloved Son with whom I'm well pleased. Talk about saying I endorse him. God the Father, his voice heard from heaven. I love the, the summarizing statement of this Jesus in the Gospels to me is, in the Gospels, when the Roman centurion and Jesus dies and the land is dark for those hours during his crucifixion and then when he breathed his last, an earthquake happens and the rocks split and people are raised from the dead from the tombs and the Roman centurion, looking at some of this, he says, that also line, he says, in absolute awe and wonder, truly this man was the son of God. Yeah, you get it, dude. You get it. You're starting to understand this is not just any normal person. This is him who has been attested to you by God. Notice also, Jesus was delivered up for you. This is the very plan of God to send his son to die for our sins. In verse, in verse 23, look at the sovereignty of God here. This is one of these verses you just have to sit for a little bit on and just consider. I mean, Loved ones, how thankful are you for the sovereign love of God that was not by chance, that was not accidental, but the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, his love sent his son to die for you and me. He was attested, he was delivered, and then he was crucified. Notice, Jesus crucified by you. And some of us would be like, well, I, I, didn't, I didn't kill him here. I mean, this is the Jews and the Romans. They're the ones who are responsible for his death. But the hymn says it so well. The hymn, How Deep the Father's Love. I love when we sing songs of such good theology. It's so healthy. This is what we're supposed to do. Behold the man upon a cross. My sin, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice. Call out among the scoffers. That's right. That's so good. That's so good. We have to see this. It was my sin that held him there. It was my sin that held him there. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. And therefore I know, I mean, it's just so well written. I know that it is, that it is finished. My sin and my sin. Jesus ultimately was crucified by you, by me, by every human who's ever lived because of our sin that made Jesus have to go to the cross. You know, it'll be a few minutes from now in our sermon or in Peter's sermon here that the audience, the text says, will be cut to the heart. Literally, they will be stabbed in the heart of their conviction and their conscience. Why? 
this is what happens when you realize, I mean, when you truly realize that your sin sent the Son of God to die. It's easy for us to look at a distance and see the cross and be able to say, yeah, the Jews killed him or the Romans killed him, whatever it is. They did. But again, so did we. So did we. You know, we, um, we get to celebrate the Lord's Supper today. And I just, I really, really, really exhort you and urge you, as you hold the symbols, we're always trying to seek this. Do not let this be ritual. When you hold the symbol of the blood, you say his blood because of my sin. His blood, my guilt. His blood. Think of the sins you committed this week. Think of the awful thoughts that we had. Think of the actions that we performed in utter selfishness and greed and maybe sensual sin. All of those hold the symbols and let's be humbled by the reality that his blood, my sin, his blood, my guilt, his blood, my blame, his blood, again, my deserved death, his blood, his punishment, which should be my punishment, his blood, God's wrath. It should be God's wrath on me and you. Attested, delivered, crucified. I want you to notice the fourth move within these beautiful verses here. Jesus raised to free you. Verse 24. This is the heart of Peter's sermon. Jesus died, but now he's alive. I love that song we sing so much in recent years. What a beautiful name. Death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. Silence the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring. The praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again. You have no rival. You have no equal. Now and forever our God reigns. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is. That is a good spot for an amen. Bless you for that. Jesus demolished death. Look at verse 24. I love this one. It was not possible for him to be held by it. That's awesome. That's awesome. Death gave its greatest effort. Death did all it could to try to hold Christ in the grave. You could only hold him for three days. Death did not stand a chance. You see that phrase there, loosing the pains? Loosing the pains in verse 24, literally that is birth pains. So in this sense, I love this, in this sense, the tomb becomes a womb for Jesus to burst forth into everlasting life, defeating death. The tomb could not hold him, and the tomb becomes a womb. Death had to give up its grip on Christ because he died defeating sin, and therefore the Father exalted him, and he was therefore defeating and defeated death. The grave would explode to life eternal, which again is the verification of the lordship of Jesus, I mean, there's just, there's, there's just none like Jesus. Like, I don't know what your thoughts were this week. I don't know how much TV you watch and how much time you wasted playing stupid games on your phone or whatever it may be or how many useless conversations we were engaged with or whatever it might be. I'm just telling you, man, the more we can put our thoughts in Jesus, like the more we can just like look up and think of Jesus and not ourselves, man, the better off we are. You know, I mean, just like honestly, it's such a wonderful thing to do. And you let the scriptures like this, like look at, look at Peter, he's like, Jesus, 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 like Jesus, Jesus, 3,000 souls will be saved. Jesus, 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 look at Jesus. You see Jesus Christ and everything changes. How is it possible 3,000 souls were saved? Because Jesus is alive. Answer number two, because Jesus is both Lord and Christ. Okay, watch what Peter does now. Consumed by the Holy Spirit, he reaches again for the authority and the authentication of God's word, of course. And this is what we pick up in verse 25. Notice what Peter does. Now he verifies what he's saying through scripture. For David says concerning him, concerning Jesus, Psalm 16, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh will also dwell in hope. Great name for a church. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your holy one see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Verse 29. Look, watch, watch Peter now. He, he quotes again, all from memory. If 
by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He quotes Psalm 16. Now he provides his explanation. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Follow his argument. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ that he was not abandoned, re-quoting Psalm 16, he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. So what Peter says here in Psalm 16, he says, David is anticipating a resurrection. But then Peter argues here, Peter says, well, it can't be David, because David died and was buried. In fact, his tomb's right over there. His tomb is still with us today. So how could it be David? Therefore, this prophecy that David makes can't be about himself. This prophecy must be about someone greater. This prophecy actually is about the Christ, Messiah, the anointed one, the one who has come to deliver and save. This prophecy that David speaks here is referring to none other than Jesus the Christ. And he says, in case there's any doubt, I just want to remind you, we were all witnesses to the fact that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. Peter's like, hundreds of us saw him. We saw him, we talked to him, we ate with him, we loved him. We are witnesses to the fact that Jesus Christ is alive. And again, you and I right now, you and I right now, if you're, if, if you're alive in Jesus Christ, we are witnesses to the same. We are witnesses to the reality of Jesus Christ is alive. And we spoke to him today and we love him and we know him and he's changed us. Awesome to see what Peter's doing. You're the fact, witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember too, Peter himself, he went through, I mean, how do you explain the sorrow Peter must have gone through on Good Friday? How do you explain the depth of pain and sorrow and hopelessness? But then now, on, on, on the same level, how do you explain the inexpressible joy that Peter must have gone through on Easter Sunday? And then Peter would be personally restored to the risen Christ. And here he is now. His faith has never been more robust than and this sermon right here in this text. And with eyes of fire for the Lord in that moment, looking upon those that he is speaking to. And with absolute authority, Peter quotes Psalm 16. Again, in verse 20, look at verse 28. He says, you have made known to me the paths of life and you will make me full of gladness with your presence. What does that mean here? What Peter is saying, because David spoke of Jesus. What that means now is that Christ has now been made to know the paths of life, being resurrected, eternal life, defeating death. He's with his father in heaven. He will never die again. That's what that means. And that the Christ right now is in the very presence of God being exalted to the right hand of the Father. In your presence is fullness of joy. This is where Jesus is now. This is what Peter is saying. This prophecy is saying he won't see corruption. He won't have his soul abandoned to Hades. He will rise from the dead and be with his Father in absolute glory and absolute joy. Now, I can only imagine right now as Peter speaks, and we know what's gonna happen in, in verse 41, I can only imagine the hearts of the 3,000 are beginning to supernaturally stir. Like hearts are starting to shift in the heavens. The eyes of faith are starting to open. The power of Christ's love is beginning to enter their souls. Their consciences are beginning to be quickened. But Peter's only warming up. Look at verse 33 now. He says here, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, notice, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend to the heavens, but he himself said, the Lord said, to, this is Psalm 110 now, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So this is so marvelous. You know what Peter's doing right here? And maybe some of us missed this as we read that. Peter is now linking the resurrection of Christ to the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. Follow that for a second. Say, well, well why? Why, why? Because here's why. If Jesus wasn't resurrected from the dead, he wouldn't be exalted. 
if he wasn't exalted to the right hand of the Father, then he would not have the authority to send the promised Holy Spirit again to the people of God. So what we're learning right here is the pouring out of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost was actually the verification and total proof as if we needed more, but still, the pouring out of God's Spirit proves two main things. One, Jesus is absolutely alive, and two, Jesus is 100% exalted. He had to be raised He had to be alive. He had to be exalted. When he's exalted again, he is given the authority then to send the Holy Spirit. He promised so many times to his disciples the Holy Spirit would be poured out again upon the people of God who will be saved by faith and grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what Peter's saying. He's like, listen, listen. The reason the Spirit has come is because Jesus Christ is in heaven with the Father. Don't miss Jesus, man. This Jesus, he's everything. So loved ones, you're like me a little bit. You want to look at God's text and there's, there's so much rich theology in here. It's just packed. It's just packed. But it's so important sometimes just like take a time out, step back. Step back just far enough and just to consider what Peter's saying. Just what he's like un, unfolding here. Like just like how awesome is our God? Um, how awesome is God's plan? How sovereign is our God? Everything is happening precisely as God has determined I mean, just again, just to step back again. Well, often what we do so much, we look so far down at our belly buttons and we're so concentrated on self. We miss big pictures and we miss then God's glorious sovereignty. We miss how awesome and, and amazing and large he is. And so I just want you to consider right now, just, just what Peter's saying. Listen, well, God had a plan and man sinned, but then God sent his son, Jesus Christ. He lived the perfect life, and then he died. He died a death according to the plan of God. He was crucified by the sin of others, but he crucified again, and then he was raised from the dead, and now he's exalted into the heavens. He ascended, and he's exalted, and he's sent to the promised Holy Spirit, and he's doing this because he's redeeming a people to himself all the way back again from Genesis 3. This is God's sovereign plan, and one day he's gonna return and bring you to glory. Just everything he's promised you, he's gonna make all your enemies a footstool at his feet. This is what God's doing. Again, I want you to take the problems of, 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 of this, but take your problems problems from this week and place under that sovereign God and his plan. Like of all of history and of all of creation and of all the time, I want you to take your problems at work and I'm not, I'm not diminishing them. I'm just saying in light of God's sovereign power of eternal glory through his son Jesus Christ, how big are your problems at this point? I want you to take your problems with some relationship you had this week or some kind of concern or anxiety. I want you to take your financial concerns right now, okay? I'm not diminishing them. I'm just saying, put them under the eternal, sovereign plan of God and his glory through his son, Jesus Christ. They they can't stay big. They can't. I want you to take the burden of your child not receiving the recognition that you think he or she should have on some sports team or some classroom and put it under the sovereign plan, eternal glory of God and see if they remain to become large in your eyes. Please, Lord, let it not be so. That's just good theology right there. This is the chance we have right now. Furthermore, do not miss in verse 35, the final act of salvation history that remains. It says, I will make your enemies your footstool. That's pretty neat, eh? I mean, so the only thing that remains in terms of what Jesus Christ will do when it comes to the final wrapping of salvation is he will return to judge. And I repeat, all enemies of God will become his footstool. All enemies of God. Now, this this is our hope. Listen carefully. Right here, this is our hope that carries us through our hurt. For all those who are hurting, right? So many people suffering right now in different ways. May the Lord be so close to you and near to you. And may his love be upon you. I've been telling you over and over and over again, he's gonna say, look to the hope to be carried through your hurt. Look to the hope to be carried through your hurt. Do not let your eyes get off the hope, on the hope, on the hope, on the hope, on the hope. The hurt is designed often to point us to hope. And the hope is ultimately what we live for, not the hurt of today. Let the hope carry you through your hurt. For Hundreds and hundreds of years, those who have followed Christ have had to do the same, and now they are with the Lord forever. And our turn is coming soon. 
God, help us to see that and to do that. So at this point, I got to imagine, again, I place myself in the text. I imagine being one of the people listening. The people will be in the edge of their seat. I mean, is Peter saying this stuff? I bet you could hear an absolute pin drop amongst the crowd. The theological connections are being made. The earth-shattering, life-changing truths are starting to sink in. And Peter, seizing this incredible moment, look in verse 36 now. He says, let all of the house of Israel therefore know for certain, make no mistake about it, that God has made him both Lord and Christ, who this Jesus whom you crucified. Know for certain, know for certain, Jesus is both Lord and What's Lord? Lord, ruler, sovereign over all things. Christ, Messiah, anointed one, the promised one, the deliverer, savior. Know for certain Jesus is Lord and Christ. One of the greatest proofs that we are genuinely saved in in the Lord Jesus Christ is that Jesus is Lord and savior over our lives. Question for you right now. Question for you right now within your life. In your life right now, in all honesty, who's driving? Who's driving your spiritual car? Are you driving or is Jesus driving? Who's driving? Jesus is Lord, man. He's always got the wheel. Is he driving your life? Is he driving my life? I mean, if he's Lord of the universe, how and why in the world would we ever want to take the wheel from the one who knows all things? And when he is truly Lord of our lives, and we see him as the beautiful savior that he is, we gladly, we gladly surrender the wheel to the one who cannot make any mistakes or any errors. Jesus Christ is Lord. And by the way, that, that whole phrase now, the Lord Jesus Christ, should have new meaning. He is Lord, he is Christ. And when we say that, let's, God help us to be so mindful. The Lord Jesus Christ. So consider the totality of this day in Acts 2 so far. Imagine all you've witnessed. Like you show up, you're not sure what, you're not expecting anything. Then all of a sudden the Holy Spirit, the wind, the fire, the miracles of languages, the transformation power, the incredible gospel witness, the exaltation of Christ. Just imagine hearing all the truths of Jesus before you, the scripture that has been promised, the scripture fulfilled in Christ, the only son of God, the holy one, the Messiah himself, all of this is starting to sink in. Like you're sitting there, you're one of the 3,000, you are starting to see Jesus for the first time ever. Like you're starting to see who he is and you're becoming alive and then these words follow. Peter says... Peter says, verse 36, this Jesus whom you crucified. And at that point, in that moment, the Holy Spirit is working. Imagine the conscience of the individual who's being awakened to the things of Christ. Imagine the conviction Imagine the absolute beginning of heart devastation. Many of these people, many of them were there to say crucify him. All of them on some level or another heard and witnessed the events attested to them by God of Christ and all of them on some level chose not to believe and therefore crucified him as well. Imagine the sorrow. Imagine the fear. Imagine the regret. Imagine the inner revulsion. What have I done? What have I done? What have I done? What have I? Because you're starting to believe now. And you start to believe, you realize, wait, just a few weeks ago, I had my hand in that man, and he's, he, I killed God? The inner revulsion that begins to take place. And let me add this too, though. At the same time, as devastating as that is, it is also the beginning of revival. It's the beginning of thousands of hearts turning to the Lord. How is it possible 3,000 were saved? Well, point number three, answer number three then is this, because only Jesus can redeem. Only Jesus can redeem. Look at verse 37 now. Now, when they heard this, they were, this is such an important phrase, underlined circle, whatever it is, they were cut to the heart. 
What an amazing moment. And they said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, notice this, eh? Like, notice this. No excuses. There's no delay. There's no passing on the blame to someone else. When, see, when the Holy Spirit's truly working, man, this is what we pray for in our place. We pray for that so much here over all the years and in the future, God. Look at this. Brothers, what shall we do? Brothers, what shall we do? Tell us what to do. How can we be saved? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. I, w- I want you to see this, and I pray, oh God, would you birth this in some way, even now at this time. One of the sincere marks of all true revival is deep and personal awareness of sin. A deep and personal awareness of sin. You know of the incredible testimonies of the revivals in the 20th century, story after story, people, when, when, when God truly moves, people come in, they, they find their way to the place and the meeting place of God and they literally cry out, have mercy, is there mercy for me? Is there mercy for me? Tell us what to do. How can we be saved? They're just begging someone to tell them, how can we be saved? One of the greatest or these famous sermons ever in America, and certainly one of the greatest, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God by Jonathan Edwards. While Edwards was preaching on the judgment of God, he just, he sat there and just read his notes like this. He read his notes like this as he read whatever there was no attempt to manipulate anyone on any level. As he was doing this, the Holy Spirit moved in such a powerful way, people began to cry out audibly and screaming, what must I do to be saved? What must I do? People say, I'm going to hell, I'm going to hell. There's an utter awareness of the reality of where they stand apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. At one point during the sermon, there was so much noise and groaning People audibly, it's like people on a battlefield who've been so wounded and they just groan for help. In the church service, this was happening. The Holy Spirit's moving so powerfully, so thick with the presence of God and the awareness of sin. Edwards had to stop and wait until the groaning subsided and he may continue with the news and the love of Jesus Christ upon souls who recognize how dead they are apart from him. And I gotta say this, man, that aspect is so missing in the church. We are, we are so busy in the church trying to make people like us. In the last generation, so much of the church has been trying to cater to the world. And in the attempt to want to be liked, it's amazing how you fail to love people by showing them what their greatest need is, the forgiveness of their sins. It's one of the reasons we've had one of the reasons we've had people walking out of these services ever since this church started. At least once a weekend, I would wager. Because at the end, so many don't want to hear the reality. And yet to fail to tell people that you are not loving them at all. And look at Peter here, man. He's not trying to be liked. He is loving them the best possible way he can by showing them the Lord Jesus Christ and the reality of their betrayal and hardness of heart and their utter brutality of rejection as they spit in the face of Christ and literally killed the Son of God. So here in our passage, you have the first ever true revival and it says they were cut to the heart. Um, Cut, literally stabbed. They were stabbed in the heart. What do we learn here, church? Very careful, okay? There is no true conversion without conviction. There is no true conversion without conviction. And there's no true revival apart from repentance. There's no true revival apart from repentance. Can you imagine the fear and the dread of coming to this realization you killed the Son of God? Think, 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 okay? And loved ones, they killed him. But we also killed him. All of us, all of us, we killed Jesus Christ. Our pride, our lust, our sexual sin, our greed, our unforgiveness, our idolatry. And that's just this week. Again, it was our sin that held him there. I 
and the glory and the beauty of true brokenness. See what happens here? Like, like brokenness breaks out. Really the power and the beauty of personal devastation. So many of us, our greatest fear ever is to be personally devastated. We do everything we can to try to prevent ourselves from brokenness and personal devastation because the pride that seeks to hold us together and try to make things work. We fail to realize by faith in Jesus Christ, the more we surrender, the more we're broken, the more we're personally devastated in Jesus Christ, the more we begin to live. That's where life is actually found. Look at the souls that were absolutely transformed here in this message because of what happened. And Peter, with the authority of Christ himself, he says in verse 38, he says, you gotta repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. For the forgiveness of your sins, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Why repent? This is 100% essential. Repent is the first word in the gospel. Repent is I turn to God. I turn from sin, I, tur- I start turning towards the Lord. When they say, what shall we do, what shall we do? They are beginning to turn, we killed Christ. They're turning from their sin and they're turning now to God. Repent is the first word in the gospel. I believe in the power of repentance at conversion and ongoing, that we may not grieve and quench the Holy Spirit of God as well. Then notice the command, be baptized. Look at that command an outward demonstration of an, of an internal, internal transformation. Hey, question right now, have you been baptized? We've got a baptism service coming up in a few weeks. Have you been baptized? I want you to feel the weight and the glory of that command. Have you been baptized? I want you to feel the weight and the glory that is given not to earn anything from God as the demonstration of what Jesus Christ has done for you. And all that he's done for you and me. And then the desire and the command to give him glory and the joy of brothers and sisters around you to be baptized as an outward demonstration of the inward reality of the fact that you've been saved in the Lord Jesus Christ. Feel the weight of the command and obedience towards baptism. Feel it. It's good. And notice here how closely repentance and faith and forgiveness and the gift of the Holy Spirit are all kind of together here, the regeneration, the repentance, the conversion, the beginning of sanctification, it's just so beautiful. In verse 39 it says, for everyone whom the Lord God calls to himself. Is God calling you today? Is the Lord Jesus calling you today? And then look at verse 40. Save yourselves from this crooked generation. Isn't that so good? Like back then and then today, the message translates this, save yourselves from this sick and stupid culture. Yeah. Yeah, this this culture is going nowhere good. This world's going nowhere good. Save yourselves from this crooked generation. Save yourselves from this sick and stupid culture. Run to the Lord Jesus Christ where there is truly life. And 3,000 souls at that moment, they see Jesus as alive. They see Jesus as Lord. They see Jesus as Christ. And they see Jesus as the one and only one who can save. And at that moment, 3,000 lives, 3,000 souls will never be the same again. Glory to God. Amen, church? It's awesome. It's so beautiful. Christ is my reward and all of my devotion. Now there's nothing in this world that can ever satisfy. Through every trial, my soul will sing, no turning back. I've been set free Christ is enough for me Christ is enough for me Everything I need is in you Everything I need Christ, my all in all, the 
joy of my salvation And this hope will never fail Heaven is our home Through every storm My soul will sing Jesus is here To God be the glory Christ is enough for me Christ is enough for me Everything I need is in you Everything I need I have decided to follow Jesus No turning back, no turning back I have decided to follow Jesus No turning back, no turning back The cross before me, the world behind me No turning back, no turning back The cross before me, the world behind me No turning back, no turning back Christ is enough for me Christ is Enough for me Everything I need is in you Everything I need Christ is enough for me Christ is enough for me Everything I need Church, we want to thank you for joining us online here today, and I just encourage you to go to our stream page, and while you're on there, you can find our children's curriculum. Uh, You can submit your prayer requests. You can give your offering. You can fill a connection card on there as well. Please feel free to let us know how you're doing. Let us know how we as staff can be praying for you. And lastly, church, just know that you are loved by an awesome Savior.